Planning Policy Commission. Tonight we have uh, the honor of having the Development Commission join us uh, this evening for their uh, important input on some of the things we're going to discuss tonight, which are the Gilman Boulevard corridor and the um, amendments to the central area plan. Uh, so the first thing on our agenda is the approval of minutes of October 25th. So do I have a, a would anybody like to approve? Make I'd a motion. Like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting on October 25th. I have a second. I second it. Oh, sorry, Bill. <laughs> Any discussion or changes? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Hearing none, the motion passes. So tonight we're going to start our meeting with a presentation on the Gilman Boulevard corridor concept which is uh, near and dear to, all, to our hearts. It's an important part of the uh, community. So Brianne Ross, our senior engineer, is going to update on what's going on. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having, having me here. Um, so my name's Brianne Ross. I'm a senior transportation engineer for our public works department. Um, with me is Nathan. He's our project manager for the consultant, uh, MIGSVR, who did the work. Um, so he'll be on hand as we get into questions and discussion. But we wanted to come here tonight um, with, with both of you groups um, because we know how much uh, you both have seen, like the Green Necklace Plan, Central Issaquah Plan, um, and have those types of connections. And then plus with DC, uh, ultimately we'll be implementing some of this stuff as developments come in and do frontage improvements. So um, we wanted to, to share this with you. So um, we're talking about Gilman from SR 900 to Front Street. And uh, when we started this project, we wanted to make sure that we uh, addressed our safety concerns on Gilman, uh, planned for a future Gilman that might not be what Gilman, how Gilman functions today, or the, the buildings and land use and businesses that are on Gilman today, but, but look towards the future and, and how do we accommodate uh, what we foresee coming in, in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, we also wanted to have some meaningful community participation and make sure that we got uh, community buy-off on this as we go forward and can build that consensus. And then this is going to feed into to future projects, both as uh, developer frontage improvements as well as potentially city capital projects. So uh, right now, we are here with you. We will be going to city council in January, um, taking the same framework document to them. Um, and we've had a, a great last couple of months. Uh, we started off with the project scope and, and getting the things started, and then um, verified project objectives, looked at the existing documents that we already had. We knew that there's been already a lot of work around Gilman with, with the central physical plan, with the green necklace, uh, various things like that, and then did that meaningful community participation as well. And then um, we've presented already to Parks Board and Economic Vitality Commission, and here with you tonight. So as I mentioned, we, we did look at all of the other documents in the city and how they relate to Gilman. Um, and then we had stakeholder meetings where we met specifically with uh, business and property owners, uh, inviting everyone around, especially around the Gilman area. Uh, we heard from them that you know traffic access, car access to their businesses are, are important to businesses, which we would expect. Um, they also want to have great visibility from the street to their building and signs. Uh, and they appreciated the transparent process that we were trying to do in, in incorporating those <coughs> property owners and business owners throughout the area. And then um, wanted to also make sure that whatever we do is implementable. We then also met with the community, had a community workshop. Um, we, in that conversation, got into more of uh, a conversation about what would it look like to be able to park once on Gilman and walk around uh, to different stores. 
also looking at what does it mean when um, there's more residents on Gilman. You know, Atlas was the first department building on Gilman and, and there will likely be others. And what, what does that look like? Um, and then also certainly considering the future of, of sound transit light rail in the vicinity when that comes. So, and then reinforcing that, that Gilman is a successful business corridor now and we wanna make sure it, it stays successful as a business corridor in the future as well. So uh, we've done a lot of outreach. We had a survey. We ended up with 760 people responding, answering at least one question, which was great. Um, and we've had uh, a lot of different business visits, talking to property owners, uh, trying to get the word out to people and uh, different community groups. And this is a map of where we uh, where people said they lived, who filled out the survey. So a pretty good representation from citywide uh, for those people that were, were interested in Gilman, which is great. We like to see that. Did, did everyone here see that survey or have a chance to participate? Yeah. Nice, good. So um, one of those, so those, hopefully you guys saw the survey. This, these are the results out of that survey, you can see that there is uh, support for making uh, it, um, Gilman a more pedestrian friendly environment, uh, increasing the separation from traffic so that the sidewalk's not right next to the travel lanes as it is currently in some places. Also enhancing those crosswalks, making them more visible. Um, we also saw a lot of support for improving the lighting on Gilman and different amenities like streeting, street trees and, and planting areas. We also asked people about, about biking on Gilman and um, while the, the strongest support was to make sure that there was a connection for the regional trails there, um, and then we asked what type of bike facility people would want on Gilman. And that was the only question in the survey that was a pick one, where they didn't have the option to pick all of the above. Um, and that's where we really looked at getting something off the road. People definitely support a bike facility that's off road, like the protected bike lane or um, like a shared path. Um, it, the natural environment got the most support. Uh, except it's timing traffic signals, <laughs> um, where incorporating stormwater into our natural features is something that, that was really important to those that took the survey. And so this survey really fed into what we have as these community goals. And um, we know that not all of these goals always work together, that there will need to be some prioritization as we go forward. Um, but the initial list of, of goals was identified by the project team after reviewing those existing documents and discussing the outcomes of those past studies and planning efforts. And then it was, these are the goals that were presented to the public in the online survey. And then also again to the property owners and the business owners. And so then based on all those, that feedback that we received, these goals have been updated. Um, the updated goals were presented at that community workshop and that's where we got um, support for continuing forward with these same goals. So um, the primary goals listed here uh, do reflect the feedback that we've heard. And as I said, there are competing needs among those community goals. And not all the goals are necessarily applicable in all sections of Gilman, right? So we know that Gilman is a longer corridor and that the needs of the corridor can change as you go through it. So that's something that we'll continue to resolve as we go into the corridor concept. So highlighting a few existing conditions, um, there's the, the creek that's adjacent to the commons and that crosses Newport Way. There's also Issaquah Creek. Um, there's bike lanes for about half of the corridor there are bus stops along Gilman, and there's a, a good trail network that surrounds Gilman. So an overview of the enhancement opportunities uh, that, that are in your framework document you have. Um, it, and one thing that we've, and all things that we've talked about, uh, the gateway type uh, on the ends, making sure that we can signal to drivers 
that they're no longer on I-90. That was a, a topic of conversation we had a few times, is that especially on the ends, as people come off of I-90, they tend to drive like they're still on the freeway and a little bit faster. Um, so using that as an opportunity. Um, also using that as an opportunity potentially to kind of create, start to create a signature street so that people um, feel like Gilman's a destination. Also looking at new street crossings that have been identified in, in previous plans. Um, enhancing the creek. Evaluating existing driveways that are along Gilman and also providing pedestrian access from Gilman to the stores. That was another topic we talked about, is if you are walking on Gilman and you want to get to a store, you're typically walking across a long um, parking lot. And how could that be enhanced or strengthened? So that's uh, a general overview of where we've come to date. Uh, we wanted to open up the floor to all of you. Um, hopefully you received our memo in your packet where you know, we're, we're, we are looking for some input. We're also looking for um, hopefully your endorsement going forward as we take this framework document which, which highlights these overarching uh, goals and opportunities. We'll take that to council in January. And so um, that's where we're here tonight. So one of the topics uh, of conversation that we thought you guys might be interested in is um, if the framework plan incorporates uh, the Central Issaquah plan and Green Necklace plan um, as you guys would expect. So this is where we can discuss. <laughs> Any comment? From my perspective, I think that's hard to answer because right now, um, specifically regarding um, uh, kind of the tree canopy um, and adding in greenery, it's very conceptual, which is okay. This is an early document. Um, and I want to start by also saying you guys did a really nice job. I really like this, the plethora of maps and keys. You guys did a really nice job on communicating. Um, I thought it was a really clear document. But specifically regarding um, this point, I think that it's a little too conceptual to answer accurately because right now we're still debating what does that look like, even as far as like where is the sidewalk go? Do we have the trees on one side, the other, both? You know, so um, I think that that answer is that it's baking nicely, but it's not quite done. I can't, I can't honestly say that you nailed it because there's just the implementation of it isn't there. So without without seeing it, it's really hard to answer that for me. But we might be on the right track with what we've got so far. Yes. Great. I think concept is, is awesome. Um, there are just a few things when I went through the, the wordage that kind of concerned me that, and you brought it up that maybe some of these things don't, will not work together and, and not get in there, but the concepts are great. Um, having more crosswalks on Gilman, what does that do for traffic? And you know, if you put another 10 crosswalks in there, are we going to be able to get down Gilman at all or more access to Gilman? Um, I think you have to be very careful with that. It sounds wonderful, but really does it do what we really want it to do? You have to stand over here with the mic. That's going to be an important part of the, the phase two of this project is kind of developing concepts and alternatives that can be evaluated, looked at from a traffic standpoint, seeing what it's doing to the movement of traffic, the level of service of traffic, the delay, um, and how does that incorporate? I, I understand that. Yeah. The concept itself, it yeah. sounds wonderful, you know, but to put it into yeah. actual yeah. implementation is a long way off. There's a lot of things that have to be looked at, like traffic and all these other possibilities, like lanes, do they really work, do it, whatever. I, I think Joan's point is great, especially um, with the, um, the Westerly Corridor. The idea of putting two more stoplights in like a five block radius where the rally um, um, area is gonna be, seems like it will be counterproductive to the flow of traffic. Um, 
Right now, obviously that area is already congested and backs up and even timing the lights, adding two more lights right there, I think is a mistake as far as the flow goes. Um, what that means obviously is that you're only turning right out of Raleigh. You're either exiting onto Gilman or from behind the complex and looping to where you're going. There's just not gonna be any left turns, you know, going on to 900 from Gilman if you're going from the Raleigh property. Um, and so I think that sometimes uh, realities like that have to be addressed rather than being like, let's just add a light and then they'll be able to turn because what's gonna happen is you're gonna get four cars going through and even though all the lights are timed, no one's gonna be getting through and you're gonna have a massive traffic jam of people coming off of the freeway, people continuing on 900 and traveling on. Um, but I think that some of those, some of the details that we do have as far as light cars go um, will give some hiccups. Yeah, and um, you know, we have in looking at those, you know, assessing those driveways, um, especially on the rally end, as you mentioned, uh, that is that is something that, that we need to do. And, um, you know, we even did talk with EVC about how, you know, restricting driveway access is a really hard conversation with businesses, but we also have s safety things that we need to address as well. So there will be a balance in looking at, you know, driveway access and what uh, level of access that each driveway has. Um, if driveways are consolidated, and then um, how that can be addressed going forward. The summaries that you gave us didn't necessarily show me that there was a big community buy-in to adding a plethora of crosswalks. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a few more are needed, mm -hmm. but having that be a priority, I didn't really read that. What I more read was that people want the, the option for walkability, meaning that what we really need is some type of parking structure, somewhere where people can dump their car and walk without necessarily, I need to be able to cross back and forth at every point across Gilman. They just wanna feel like it's um, less of an arterial and more of a connection between all these different businesses is what I took away from, mm -hmm. from the respondents coming back. And so um, to me, the solution was more in sidewalks and um, a dedicated place that someone can park rather than crosswalks all over Gilman. Right, and I think that um, enhancing crosswalks doesn't always mean more. Right. It can mean making ones we have more visible and more usable. And time, and time with the lights better. Right, yeah. So I'd like to uh, advocate for the bike piece of it. Um, from a strategic standpoint, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> today bikes may not be a huge component of this transportation initiative because a lot of people are not biking. But as we look forward to e-bikes, uh, just within the last three years, they've actually dropped almost 50% of the cost. So you can now pick up a reasonable e-bike for about $3,000. And I'm now starting to see them on Squawk Mountain and they're zipping up these hills. So as people, as a, the price of e-bikes starts to drop, um, you're gonna see a lot more people purchasing e-bikes, I believe, especially for our area, because you don't need a license for it. You don't need insurance. They go up to 25 miles an hour, up to 25 miles. Um, and I think you're gonna start seeing a lot more people use those to get back and forth to the stores. My wife would certainly, she's asking for one now, and she would not feel comfortable on a moped or a motorcycle, but a bicycle is something that's doesn't have a lot of barriers and a lot of people would be very comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was looking here in, in your plans about shared bike paths. Uh, as a avid cyclist, I have real problem with shared bicycle paths in that when I go bicycle riding on like the Burt Gilman Trail, um, up, up and around the uh, UW District and so on, or the East Lake Sammamish Trail, you have, um, parents with strollers that are three wide, they literally take up the whole trail, and so you're trying to pass them, that's kind of an obstruction there. Um, and then you have dog walkers with flexi leashes, and they, the dogs just, you know, they're on a leash, that's legal, but they're literally going across the way, and if you're riding past them, all of a sudden the dog starts chasing you, or they run out in front of you. Um, and so there's a lot of potential hazard with that. As a pedaling bicyclist, it's not, I'm not going so fast I can't stop, but with an e-bike, um, they are now state laws, allows them to be on our trails. These guys are going 25 miles an hour, and I realize that their trail speed, I think is supposed to be 15 or 20 in some locations. 
there's a huge risk factor for accidents. So when you put bicycles with pedestrians, and a lot of pedestrians don't like bicycles, Mm -hmm. or, you know, and I don't like pedestrians. I, I, <laughs> wait a minute. Neither do I. There's a war going on. Uh, that totally came out wrong. <laughs> Strike that. Uh, when I'm bicycle riding, I don't want to compete with a, a pedestrian as the pedestrian doesn't want to compete with me. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think putting them in their own place where a bicycle is protected for, or a pedestrian is protected from a bicycle and a bicycle is protected from a car is going to get more people on bicycles, um, which uh, will lead to a better parlous experience for our people, and especially as we grow. I think we're going to see a lot more people go in that direction. So um, I probably just said way too much, but um, I'd like to see some alternative options to uh, bike paths. And I also noticed that I read in here where uh, Gilman wasn't going to emphasize so much on the bike piece of it, or maybe that was part of the survey that it's gonna focus on traffic more than bikes. There might be alternate routes for bikes. Throughout the outreach process, the, the number one thing that we heard was that vehicular traffic and moving cars was very important to continue to support businesses. And recognizing that there are off-street op options for bikes, potentially being the Maple to Juniper Trail and making that more visible and more accessible to people, and the potential conflicts between bikes and cars, people have generally been supportive throughout the process that bikes shouldn't be on the street and cars should be prioritized. Um, it's not that bikes don't matter, is the feedback that we've gotten, but they should be secondary to cars and probably also secondary to pedestrians um, from the feedback that we've received. And uh, when I, because that's how I read it too, um, and that's looking at it from people who never used e-bikes. E-bikes is bleeding edge. I mean, it really is bleeding edge considered social norms right now. But you look at places like Denmark, everybody bikes. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that we're going to become Denmark, but aspirationally, Sure, especially if we make it easier for people to get up these hills and they don't have to take a bus, they don't have to drive, and these e-bikes can zip right up the hills and people who are out of shape don't have to work that hard to do that. So um, but I think not putting bikes in back alleys is important because uh, they need to be front and center and somewhat main arterial. Um, but they don't have to be in the flow of traffic, but if you reduce the, f the speed limit of Gilman to 25, then, then I could see a lot of people saying, okay, I can ride my bike on a bike path on Gilman because it's only 25 and I'm almost going that speed. Mm -hmm. so, I think yeah. it needs to be part of your strategy and a stronger emphasis on bikes because it's coming, winter's coming. So I just want to... <laughs> Make one little comment. So um, you mentioned Denmark and everybody rides bikes. That's true. But in Norway, yes, they do ride bikes. But the the, the traffic is horrendous. There is two two parts to it. It's not just focusing on on bikes. And so it doesn't. It's not perfect. Yeah, I actually take the opposing view. I actually had the good fortune of being in Clearwater, Florida this weekend. <laughs> Beautiful weather. And they have more of a shared bike pedestrian. I just don't know if we have the sidewalk or the space. Just looking at this picture here, um, you couldn't do something like that. I'm thinking like Venice Beach, Santa Monica, areas like that where you can, if you have a wide enough pathway, have bikes and pedestrians. And a universal knowledge, one's more towards the right, one's more towards the left. But I, I don't think we have the space. And I think that would kind of depend on businesses, and I don't think we have the easements to do it. So, what was the easement? Yeah, what was the easement? 65 feet? You meant it's in here. So um, the existing right-of-way varies, and actually there's some areas where we're not using the full extent right. of the city's right-of-way, so where we would have some extra space. There is some areas uh, at, in this vicinity, as the picture shows, um, where we don't have extra space. But that's also an ongoing conversation. Do we want um, property owners, as they redevelop, to dedicate right-of-way to build a wider facility, or do we want to work within the right-of-way that's available currently and um, you know, narrow up our 
our roadway section in some areas and then look at a wider section in others. Actually, to his point, you could do a shared bike path if it was, if it was wide enough. Mm -hmm. um, you're thinking something like Green Lake where you're designating kind of slow and fast, but then you need to have <clears throat> that leads like two directions for each path, which is like well, in East Lake, like Dillman, um, which is just the Wild West. Yeah, yeah. East Lake Sammamish Parkway is a great example. It's the trail is, I think, what, 12 feet? 12 feet isn't wide enough for really pedestrians and bicyclists because you have those pedestrians with um, strollers and you have pedestrians with flexi leashes. But if you had maybe a, a 20 foot um, pathway where you designated maybe five feet for a bicycle and you striped it for a bicycle and then people would have the understanding that that's a two-way bicycle path. There are things that you can do, but I think there just needs to be more strategic look at how you handle a bicycle path um, because I think that it will be a significant part of our future. So I think uh, you're doing that. I think we've had a discussion at these things that the concept and now you have to get to work and actually implement them. I'd like to hear from the DC members. Um, I I have, a, I guess, one question, one comment, but one question about it is, would anybody be willing to give up a lane of traffic for a bike lane? No. Yes. No. Absolutely not. <laughs> and Because I think that would be, it sounds to me like from the survey results that there'd be very few people that would say, take away a travel lane like they've done on 2nd Avenue in Seattle and turn it into bike lane. The, um, comment I would have is it sounded like one of the issues was the pedestrians wanted to be separated from traffic and it seemed like there was an indication of using landscaping to do that but could that separation instead of landscaping be more of the bike path so it's just roadway bike path pedestrian if you have enough room for that and not worry about trying to put trees in there somewhere so it won't look as nice well, and I think the survey indicated that people cared more for the trees than the bike yeah. lane, yeah. <laughs> also. I, yeah. um, I think what would be interesting is to see a picture of like Champs Elysees. There's a major roadway where it's going back and forth, and it has, I mean, not that Gilman's going to be that grandiose, but the idea where you have floods of tourists walking left and right, and you have a long mile road, um, it'd be interesting to see a picture of that. And again, obviously a much smaller scale, but something kind of how they did it there because they deal with a lot of pedestrian traffic and a lot of vehicle traffic. I would just observe, having lived there for a long time, that, uh, those boulevards, which are so wonderful, were designed by Aaron Hausman to allow uh, a battalion, a company of cavalry, <laughs> <laughs> to ride stirrup to stirrup down the street to control mobs. That's the original architectural purpose. <laughs> I wonder if it could handle an e-bike. <laughs> so, so I think one of the one of the issues that clearly there's going to be a lot of competing interests. You know, if you have ten priorities or ten things that people have identified are really important, one of the things that seems to be not developed that, that I saw, and maybe I just missed it, was uh, some some methodology of prioritizing. You know, it's not a, a vote system. It's a uh, you know, a strategic, a strategic plan would say, from a priority perspective, here's, if, if we have to give up something, this is what goes first and second or third, you know, but coming up with some kind of evaluative process that allows you to be cl clear text saying, do, you know, if, if in fact people wouldn't be willing to give up a traffic, a lane of traffic for a bike lane, you know, how do you decide that? You know, what, what is the mechanism that you'd use to do that? And, and that's gonna be part of the next phase of work for us. We're going to be developing that evaluation criteria and then going back out to the public and the business and property owners and talk with them about, you know, what should this look like with all the different constraints and over overlapping needs and how do we fit everything in and talk about both the evaluation criteria as well as potential concepts. So do you have any timetable for Starting this process? Um, yeah, so 
after we go to council in January, assuming that they let us know that we're heading in the right direction, that's what we're looking from from them, um, then we are going to take a look at some of our existing infrastructure, take a look at what um, needs are under the ground, because say if we have an aging sewer pipe the length of Gilman, um, you know, that could mean we're going to tear up Gilman anyways and give us a little more flexibility in what we could come up with as for a design versus if all of our existing infrastructure in Gilman is in, you know, just brand new and we don't want to move anything, then, then we're going to make sure that where we put our curb and gutter or where we put our trees, we're not going to put a tree on top of a sewer line, those types of things. So our first will be, step will be to evaluate uh, that level of existing condition and then um, as, as Nathan said, uh, we will look at developing a couple concepts and uh, the criteria and go out to the public with, with the criteria and, and concepts. Um, I'm thinking that based on our, our current budget, we have budget um, requested from council right now uh, in, in next year's budget and then there would be uh, a little bit of a remaining budget in 2020. So we probably have like 18 months uh, longer before we have like an adopted council adopted concept do you know if there's any development that is scheduled to change any part of gilman um works now well there's uh the development agreement with gilman lofts at uh rainier and juniper and gilman they're putting in a traffic signal there um which was It'll, I think, be, do we know when it's under construction? Or spring? spring? Um, and then there's, I know of one other development that's, that's looking at potential changes on Gilman. That's all I know though, I don't know. One of the yeah. other things that we're planning to do during the next phase is kind of identify and track those so that as those projects are starting, we, as we're developing a concept, are aware of what's happening along the corridor. Okay, so there will be restrictions on what exactly how they develop and how it would fit into the plan that you're going to. Right. So until we have a council adopted plan, um, we don't. When developers come in, we don't really have sure. a lot that we can tell them as far as what the future of Gilman looks like. Right. Um, that's why we really want to get this project done and and do it. Um, so yes, there could be, well, for example, Gilman Lofts, they have a development agreement. They're coming in with a signal. That'll be under construction. And um, then we will see if we can work with what that was done, done there. So just just a, a, maybe a, a comment and a question. Yeah. So um, this is long range thinking. So yes. we've got to go past the here and now and think about what's the future development pattern plan for this area, which is higher density by a long shot compared to what what's there now. And Gilman's still going to be a signature street as it comes through the city. And so the, the profile and, and the, the look and feel of this, both from uh, auto and from pedestrians or bikes, is going to be important. So uh, the design, and I know you've spent a lot of time looking at those concepts and the uh, anchoring both ends with gateway kind of treatments of some sort, I, I think makes sense. And I'm you know, commenting on that at some other meeting. But um, there's a couple other elements in, in here that aren't really um, detailed out in discussion too much. One is where light rail is going to land because with that comes like a 500 stall parking garage. Um, and so that's going to create um, kind of a, a focal point, I guess you could say, of, of activity, a lot of it auto driven, but also you'll have a lot of activity just around station and so I don't know what, how much thinking has been done about where that station may land but you have to think about that and then you're also showing a new uh, cross I-90 um, I-90 crossing and so and not only from an auto but from a pedestrian now you've got an opportunity to connect the businesses and the activities that are going on on both sides and so where it lands on Gilman Boulevard would be a nice feature as well from a both an auto, or pedestrian, cycling, et cetera. Uh, and so you just show an arrow making that connection, but it should somehow should speak to the future opportunities, I think, that those create, not only the light rail station, but um, this overcrossing. 
With relation to that, can I ask you, the where you show it is different than is shown in the Central Issaquah Plan? The last slide you had up that was from the Central Issaquah Plan where it shows, so your location is further east than it is shown in the Central Issaquah Plan, and I was curious why that is. Um, so in our TIP, our, our Transportation uh, Improvement Plan, uh, we've always, it's always been talked about as like a 10th, 11th, 12th-ish crossing, right? Um, we, this, I mean, that's, that's a really large project that needs some design work behind it to figure out where the best place for that to land is. So that's why we tried to show it as like a nice gray, uh, conceptual <laughs> line. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Technology that is happening or could happen. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. It's, in, it's certainly in the plan to happen that we would have a crossing in some vicinity, uh, but, but the exact location has certainly not been designed or determined. But, it, but an important opportunity. One of the comment, I guess, about the, in terms of your question about relation to the Central Issaquah Plan mm -hmm. standards, um, is, you know, eventually there should be, as, as I understand it, this would all be built to the right of way for the buildings that would go up along here uh, in the urban core. I can very much see it being a 25 mile an hour uh, speed limit because if it is going to be built to the street, urban street, um, it should be more of a 25 mile an hour, not a thoroughfare kind of thing. And I think it's more important for people to move through, not move through at speed. So you don't want to sit in a backup for half an hour. You don't, I don't think people are going to feel like they need to go 35 or 45 miles an hour to speed through. So the extent that in terms of thinking about it as a lower speed limit, a continual movement, um, type of area with buildings right up to the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. fit, so. All right, thanks. I also like to bring up something else I, I learned um, a couple of weeks ago. I serve on the uh, board of directors for Visit Issaquah, and I've been working very closely with the hotels, and I'm finding out that a lot of their, their patrons actually prefer to walk. Mm -hmm. um, and they're walking from Spring Hill Suites and some of the other hotels to triple X. So that's already happening and um, to their point, uh, as we start to grow, we're gonna see more and more people hitting the street. And so uh, I think we're at the very beginning stages of seeing more pedestrians and more bicycles. Um, I just thought I'd inject that there. Because it's already happening. Yeah. I, uh, I'm really excited about this. Uh, I tell you the truth, because I, I see this as the confluence of just an enormous opportunity and an equally enormous challenge. Um, and I was really happy to see the natural environment aspect of this reflected uh, in the survey results and in this document. Uh, and I've given this a lot of thought, and I believe that this uh, presents the city of Issaquah with really an unprecedented opportunity to lead the entire Puget Sound region when it comes to how we deal with street runoff. There is absolutely no global warming denial when it comes to the impact that street runoff has on salmon. And the significant amount of work that's gonna be done, however that is, uh, on Gilman Boulevard really, I think, present, uh, presents the city with an opportunity to go full bore on what we know is required to save our environment and the salmon in it, and the coho, which we raise here in Issaquah. So I, I would really like to see an emphasis put on whatever the plan is for traffic and street frontage and so on, sidewalks and so on. I'd really like to see the city uh, commit to being a regional leader when it comes to rain gardens and uh, dealing with stormwater runoff in a way that uh, we can literally not just brag about it, but uh, bring people in, bring school kids in, uh, and become a leader in that. Uh, it's just an enormous opportunity, and it's a critical issue. 
Anybody else? I have a question um, just about, um, you know, about your uh, point about development being pushed up to the edge of the film. In some areas that will work, but in a lot of yeah, sorry. In a lot of areas, development won't be able to push up against Gilman because you've got drainage, a fairly large drainage that runs parallel um, on the south side. Right. So uh, just what's the thinking about the opportunity? Because I kind of, where Randy is, the opportunity to actually integrate that into the overall design and experience as people are coming through. Because um, right now it's kind of hidden. You've got to, you know, it's kind of off to the side. And, and I think it, right. I think it's a... It's a good opportunity. Collect some shopping carts to currently, yes, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, there's certainly um, been support to trying to make that an amenity and an, a, a good piece and uh, cornerstone of, of the project of this corridor, so. So, but to your point, yes, there are some areas that buildings uh, likely will not be building up to the uh, side. Just sidewalk. a thought, I mean, the, the, the pedestrian walkways, even bikeways for that matter, don't necessarily need to run in, in line with the road. Mm -hmm. So you can take them out, take them around these features, et cetera, to create some separation. Mm -hmm. Or be creative and do something with the pivots. <laughs> right. You know, there, there can be ways to, to cover that over and have it be able to, you know, water drain through it, they will be able to use that space. Be creative, think out of the box. No, and to Michael's point, which is that the pedestrian walkways can walk around features, um, I think the main piece is that it really needs to be aesthetically pleasing with the landscaping, because again, if this is gonna be a driver for tourism, for people walking around shopping, to Ron's point, people spending the day walking up and down that 1.4 miles, I think it's gonna be really, like the tree canopy to me in my mind, should be a priority. I love the pictures of the trees on both sides. I, it just- Like some of those old magic. neighborhoods in, in Seattle are just absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. You can just eliminate the cars. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about the sound replaced. wall. <laughs> you, you show the sound wall kind of just in a portion of the area. Mm -hmm. You just build it all along I-90. That would be. <laughs> you know, is, is there a is that something that is um, tightly controlled by the state? Um, they can tell you where you can and can't do it, or the city can fund it. The state say yes for mo the most part, or. Um, so that is something that requires significant coordination with the state. Uh, if the city were to fund it, we have a lot more uh, influence. Um, certainly the state is building sound walls in some areas. Uh, they've got a pro proposed project to build it along like Northwest Sammamish Road. Um, they're not currently proposed to bring it as far as Gilman. So. I also found it a little peculiar, but I didn't, I, I think it's early enough that we don't really need to worry about the placement and the length at this point. It's kind of one of those things that we'll address once we actually have some some locations, but the way it was denoted on the map was very odd, I would say. So I get that you want to include it because it's important that we have control over what it looks like. That's an important feature, so that's what I took more is that why it's included in the document is to say, hey, we're going to make sure that this is something that's what we want and what's pleasing to us. I think what we heard from a lot of people is in that where the where that sound barrier is shown, there was a lot of concern and kind of feedback from the public that it was really uncomfortable to walk along Gilman in that area, and to provide some separation and noise barrier would be beneficial. And it also kind of um, built on some of the past planning efforts that the city had done. So that was the the rationale. Uh, the mechanics of a sound wall. I mean, it doesn't stop sound, it deflects sound, as I understand it, from some of the things that have come up in front of the DC in the last couple of years. So, so where are we deflecting, if that is correct, where are we deflecting the noise to end up sentence with the preposition? Where does it, I mean, at the concept, if, that, if the wall goes in there where it, in the document where it shows it, mm -hmm. 
uh, does it go up, does it go across, does it just bounce it back into the, uh, into the interstate? It goes back into the interstate? I honestly don't know. It goes back and it can be attenuated. You know, it's a pressure wave. Sound is a yeah, pressure wave, sure. so so it can be attenuated by the the um, texture of the wall, uh -huh. and it also is redirected back into the from the source that it came from. The reason I mentioned it at all is because uh, there has been some discussion with people that live up on Squawk Mountain about the fact that we, you know, we can hear 90 all the time, anyways. Uh, but uh, the concern is that if this went up and it was designed to protect the immediate environment, is it going to send, uh, is it going to actually result in louder noise somewhere else? Somewhere else? Uh, and that's, that would be a concern that I'd have. And to that point uh, about the sound walls, what about a vegetated sound wall? Wouldn't vegetation absorb the sound and help deflect because yeah, it's a texture. It's a textural thing, so it, it can. But then you have the issue of of what it looks like when all the leaves fall off, or how, I mean, there, there, and there's a maintenance thing. So all that comes, all that can be considered, but it's part of the design. You just have to decide what you want. How about the sound walls, like on Mercer Island, all that natural growth that doesn't foliage typically doesn't fall off, does it? Certainly there would have to be some design around this idea, right, should it move forward. You know, to Joan's point, I like the idea of thinking outside the box. Maybe that means exploring um, a raised pedestrian walkway, you know, where um, we try to build up. Uh, we know that we're, um, we've approved some pretty large um, buildings to be here, and when we think about uh, how we planned it to be, um, why think limited to the street level when uh, the, our buildings are going up? Why not think about utilizing our space in a different way as well? And that gives another opportunity for um, little mini gardens, things like that, when we think about kind of uh, maybe building up as well for our pedestrians, not just for the buildings. Um, so when you think about kind of implementation, I also want to make a point about you know, right now we have a pain point. I think, is it is it fourth right now that's closed off by the post office? Um, and um, I know for myself and for others, it's it's been a big pain point, um, having to go all the way around the loop in Issaquah every day, and just the duration of it. And when we think about um, how you're going to be running through phase two is, I really encourage you to take your time with it because kind of, the, you know, in your words, tearing up Gilman or kind of restructuring it is um, is going to be painful and in doing it in a way that is uh, quick and methodical will be very important because what we don't want is to um, have it stretch out into a duration that really is a pain point and, be, and then we then maybe once it's opened back up, have lowered the speed limit drastically. I mean, people are going to be pretty upset, and I don't know that necessarily people are going to be following along with the concept. If not, everybody is feeling like it's uh, happened at a good pace, if that makes sense. You know, you could lower it and no one, the speed limit, and no one pays attention to it because they're like, thank God this is finally open. You know, you start putting traffic lights everywhere. I mean, I think also the way that you implement and so that planning for phase two will actually make a difference in how people use it if that makes sense you know and kind of creating um the best i know this sounds really hippie but uh, the best vibes possible in the community um for how how we really restructure this space so have we confused you or no so um Seeing that no, nobody wants to do any more uh, comments, I'd like to open it up and ask the audience if they have any comments. You don't have to, but you're, if you I would do. look, well then, would you? You would just kind of tell us who you are. And well, I'm Annette Traeger. I do live down here in the valley, and I've been to multiple meetings here to try to figure out the best usage for Gilman. Is the mic? 
sorry, I'm short. <laughs> um, the best usage for Gilman Village since I do walk it almost daily. And I would like to say I want to tell you thank you. Daryl, right? Nathan, excuse me, Nathan. Uh, I really like the way that you've presented and the way that you've kind of put together your the package, I guess. I just want to think, I just think that uh, how you've done it and how you presented it and put different ideas together has been really great. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, and uh, you've been really um, uh, open and transparent too. And I thought that was really great. Also to the city, I want to say thank you too on keeping uh, open the idea of uh, uh, alerting people. I wanted to say that uh, I, <laughs> what's gonna go on in my head, but um, the biking situation, you know, where you talked about not mixing it up, I bicycles and pedestrians, uh, I use the Juniper Trail uh, almost daily too, and I do have an e-bike, <laughs> so and I do walk as a pedestrian, and I do see how they both can work together very well, and especially with that distance of the Juniper Trail, I think that's really great. Um, I think from the people I've talked to, they like to have the landscaping um, more, a little more natural with like trees, but nothing too overly done. Because as we've seen on Gilman Village, or not Gilman Village, Gilman Boulevard, uh, it doesn't seem like uh, perhaps the city has been taking care of it as well as they could. And so with more extra, you know, exotic plants or exotic plantings or whatever, it. I don't see how it can look great or be maintained by the city. I think we want to have it maintained very well, if we're going to have it. It has to be maintained and look great, in my opinion. Um, as far as a pedestrian overpass, like you were discussing, um, I don't care for that idea. I don't think, uh, as a woman, walking at night, I don't want to be in an area that I'm blocked into. So I don't think for me that would be a comfortable situation for me. Like the, uh, uh, on 900, you know, where they had that wooden thing that you had walked down this endless. Every time I walked on that, I felt <coughs> kind of uncomfortable. So I don't think as far as walking on that sort of a situation on Gilman Boulevard, that would not be a comfortable situation as a woman for me, especially at night. Anyway, thanks for listening to my comments. I hope it helped a little bit. Thank you. Would anybody else like to make a comment? I'll come back to the, the panel here. Does anybody have any last thoughts before we move on to our next discussion point? Uh, one thought about the, speaking of the bikes, I think the, what I've seen from the city of Sammamish the remainder of the East Lake Sammamish Trail, I thought I read might be finished, they think, in 2020 time frame. I'm thinking about that connection at Gilman, Rainier, where the trail comes in. I think as soon as that's finished and that opens up, we're gonna see a whole lot of bicycles come into downtown Issaquah, and it would be really nice for our plans to sync up so that changes to that intersection are finished Something's done by the same time that that trail is opened up along Samantha. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just would, it was, this was mentioned before by one of my colleagues on the Development Commission. I, the thing that, the great big elephant in the room to me is uh, sound transit. Uh, frankly, what I know about where other east side cities are with designating where the terminals are going to be uh, we're way behind, as I understand it, we're way behind the curve on that. Uh, and this project, as significant as it is to the town, I, I, you know, I don't know how we proceed without knowing more than we do about where Sound Transit is going to be and where the feeding stations are going to be and parking lots and so on. I, I, I just. I'd really like to see 
more information, if there is any, about where we are in planning for sound transit. Um, and then, you know, then we can really start tying what we're doing here on Gilman Boulevard to that, because that's going to that's gonna happen big right. time. Right. So, um, so, you know, we don't know where the sound transit station is. We know it, we expect it to be in the, you know, vicinity of Gilman. We are making sure that um, we're doing everything we can to make sure that what we are going forward with um, wouldn't preclude sound transit or vice versa, right? Um, but um, I think that maybe it was Joan, you know, asking about the developments that are coming in, right? So part of, we don't want to wait for the sound transit station be, location to be finalized and determined necessarily, because then that means that as developers come in, we can't use, you know, take advantage of that to implement the, some of the Gilman vision with the developer frontages, right? So we are, we are playing this balancing game. And as we get more information about sound transit, you know, that might c continue to impact what we do on Gilman. What does the time frame for sound transit look like? I mean, it doesn't get built until like 2040. Right, planning wise. Um, 2026. So just one more uh, comment about the work. Um, yeah. And the uh, speaker earlier mentioned this, but uh, the, the process that you went through um, to really reach out to the community and, and collect information, um, the uh, way the information, the different concepts have been uh, kind of gathered, organized, and then assimilated into some recommendations here. Uh, this is really good work. Um, and understanding we're still at a very conceptual level with this, and you're trying to figure out you know, how does this translate into real life on the ground along, along Gilman Boulevard. But for uh, the framework as you're describing this, I think this is an excellent start to the, the thinking and the future work um, that will reshape, I think, I think the sig one of the signatures Great, thank you. I would also like to mention something. Um, I work at Microsoft, and I commute from here to there by bike, um, going down the East Lake Spamish Parkway. Microsoft has over 100 buildings, and every building has between 60 to 100 bikes parked in it per day. A lot of people. Um, and I, in the short time I've been there, I've probably engaged maybe a dozen people that actually bike from Issaquah, and I just happened to stumble up upon them by chance. So I um, just want to throw that out there that there are people starting to use the bike paths in ways that you really would like them to do that, get them out of the car. So. I'm curious uh, if we see this again, if uh, if after pending council approval of this, when you're doing phase two, if you'll be coming back to us. So um, at this point, we're planning on, on probably doing more of a design shred where we'd invite, you guys would be welcome to join, um, but we probably wouldn't come specifically to the PPC or DC meetings, that we would look at having um, a more integrated process where we would potentially invite you guys and, and the, all the other boards and commissions we've visited as well to take part. So we will, we plan on keeping you guys informed. Uh, I ask because a, a big part of what we've worked on, especially in the last year, has been kind of reimagining um, the core. And mm -hmm. this is a, a big deal. And it's uh, a little bit cart before the horse. You know, um, what's going to happen here um, is really based on the concepts that we've really been working on um, of what we see coming a decade and, and further down the line. Um, so it's. I would be very interested to see um, what phase two looks like and um, how how we're going to do this and kind of how these concepts really parcel out into you know um, hard ideas. So at so at the end it will. I mean, if you're adopting this as a as something that gets included into the comp plan, you would have to come back to the PPC. Okay. I should say, we have just started to scope out next year's work. <laughs> um, Nathan and I have started talking about that to get to get ready to start in January. So we're still working on that process. Uh, 
it's always nice to uh, end on a kudo for your work. So uh, again, thanks. It's a, it's a great plan. And uh, I don't understand why this microphone keeps going off, but um, <laughs> uh, technology. So anyway, thank you. It was a great presentation and good work. And, and thanks for going out to the community and getting all of their input. Um, good work. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to take a five-minute break. And planning policy is going to go back to their original seats. And DC is uh, welcome to stay and uh, spend a few minutes discussing uh, amendments to the development and design plan. I don't think it's a, a, a major uh, discussion, but you are certainly welcome to, to stay because you're going to be implementing it.
continue the meeting tonight and talk a little bit about the proposed amendments to the central area development and design standards. But first, um, I was in error. We did not finish the discussion on the um, on Gilman. Um, they had asked for a letter of uh, approval of encouragement of. Uh, from us as PPC at, to take it with them to with a discussion with the city council. I need a motion if you're willing to, uh, if you believe that the plan as presented by uh, staff is to your liking. I understand that it's a concept, but do you think that the work is done well and we can continue on and present this to city council with our approval endorsement that's a tough one. i do i actually like how you i was <laughs> i love how you just worded that it's it's perfectly put to the fact that uh the work that's done is really excellent um and this document um is very thorough and though it's very preliminary and early i say we continue on with it as as presented so I need a motion to write that, to have this, have uh, a letter presented. Staff, write a letter with our approval. I'll, I'll also motion. Did you state the motion? Oh, I, I, a motion for uh, the Planning Policy Commission uh, to draft uh, our endorsement of this framework plan for Gilman Boulevard. Um, then it moved to council for, uh, for a second look. A second the motion. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing no op uh, opposition, the motion carries. So um, if staff would work with us to uh, write a letter of endorsement, which uh, Brianne can take to the city council. Okay, with that, we are going to start a discussion on the amendments, and we're uh, lucky to have our new senior planner, Emily, uh, kind of walk us through and what, what we're discussing tonight. Great. Thank you. My name is Emily Arteche, senior planner here at the City of Issaquah. I wanted to welcome all of the DC members out this amendment, as it, it does directly impact your workload. Um, with that being said, let's go ahead and start the presentation. So I'm here today to present a change to level of review for Central Issaquah. If you're not familiar with levels of review, they are in the development code um, located in 18. It is um, a process, a procedure for the review and decision making of land use applications. Emily. I is apologize, it, but is it could not, you speak just a little louder? Oh, sure. It, the mic is on, though, right? Yeah. So there's several levels of review that exist all the way up to level six citywide. Some have less important or less, they're less prominent, level zero review, um, all the way up to level six review, which would be the greatest potential for impacts like rezones, land use, comprehensive plan amendments, things that PPC would review. And then there's this mid-level range of review, level three, which requires development commission review, which you're very familiar with. And earlier this year, the city, adopted two separate ordinances for Talus and Isqua Highlands, which outlined some development criteria and a threshold basis for level three review. That, that um, um, code language is current and existing, but it doesn't match what we currently have in Central Issaquah. So this is a table of what Central Issaquah's level of review, level of review currently looks like. You have zero through three with three being the highest going to development commission and uh, requiring a different trigger based on, a different trigger of level of three review based on the zone that it falls within. Are there any questions about that so far? So what we'd like to do is we'd like to bring up that level three review to match what Talus and Isquah Highlands currently has. 
which would increase opportunities for the public to be informed about development that's going on, but also would bring a lot more development applications to the Development Commission. We did a little map to kind of show exactly what might be happening there. And so as you can see, these shaded areas show parcels that are over three acres in size and with the potential of um, being along some identified corridors, these blue areas, would go to a level three review. And as you can see, there are very few parcels in there that are just white colored. The shaded parcels are ones that are, would be triggered with a level three review based on size or proximity to the blue corridors. The blue corridors are areas of high visibility and that would be important for the people to know about if there's going to be a development application submitted. <coughs> this is what a revised table would look like, elevating projects to a level three review based on not only three acres or greater, but a combined three acre site, um, if there was multiple properties adjacent to each other under the same ownership, <clears throat> or located on one of those blue corridored streets. It essentially diminishes or takes out the level two review because Issaquah Highlands and Talus both require development three, I mean level three review for projects that are 45,000 square feet or greater of gross floor area. And because it is complicated, <laughs> um, a map would also be accompanying the changes to, that would also be in Central Issaquah standards to show where these blue corridors are located and when properties that come in located would have access, street frontage, or abut one of the blue corridors, then it would automatically go to a level three review. So we're here to present that change for consistency, open up a public hearing, and then get your recommendation to go to the Land and Shore Committee for their review and approval. Are there any questions about you said the, the change. You said the, uh, the square footage would be up to three acres that would require level three review or? It currently is three acres, but just to clarify with providing consistency throughout the city standards, it would be a combined three acres as well. So if you, ha if you were a property owner that owned adjacent property and combined, it was three acres or greater, it would go to level three review. That's three like individual tax parcels? Yes, if they were if there were more than one tax parcel under the same ownership. Adjacent or within the, as an area? Adjacent, under the same owner. So what does this do in the way of time delay for developers or uh, individuals who want to develop their property? And what does it do for cost to developers? Cost for developers? I'm not sure what that would do. We could look into that and, and maybe come back to you about that. As far as time goes, it would add time to the review of their projects. So currently, if they are uh, under a threshold lower than level two, level three, you know, they'd be going to level three review, which would be development commission. a little bit of context. So um, I'll give you a specific example and it may help you guys put this into some perspective. So when we talked about the neighborhood visions and we talked about um, IC, the IC zone, the intensive commercial zone, and if you remember, we basically decided to take all of IC out of Central Issaquah except for those parcels right on East Lake Sam, right? And we know one of those parcels, Carlson Kennels, is owned by um, the owner of Evergreen Ford, and they are planning to build a new car dealership there. Um, so part of what this changes, so what the threshold used to be in central Issaquah was 
uh, because when those standards were put together, the idea was we were trying to facilitate development. And so a lot of development was being allowed to be done administratively. So you could do up to 100,000 square feet of building and that would be a level one review. It would not go, it, it would not go to the development commission. It would be level two, sorry, level two. It would not go to development commission. And so what this does, because now East Lake Sam is a major street, that car dealership um, turns into a level three review and that would go to the development commission. And so part of this is coming out of a conversation with the uh, end of the development agreements and the um, adoption of the replacement regulations, which is, and came from council, which is that there are certain streets in our town that when things change on those streets, the community notices and cares, and that process should be more public, um, which is the development commission. And so what this change in code would do would be to send more things to the development commission um, when they're happening on those major streets, and that corresponds to the map that Emily showed earlier. And so, you know, it's, it's increasing the transparency related to development review. To, to Joan's question, cost-wise, there should be no cost difference because the code is still the code. It's just changing the decision maker from the city staff to the city development commission. But we're still, we will be writing the staff report. It will just go to DC for review and ultimate decision. So there's a time delay in that. Uh, but the decision should be the decision whether it comes out of staff or whether it comes out of the development commission. Has this gone to development commission for discussion? Mm -hmm. um, so code, code amendments do not go to development commission. They come to planning policy commission. So I recall going through this originally when we were wrapping up the end of the development agreements. I came at this from my uh, former role on the UVDC and found that um, losing that forum um, was something that uh, we were concerned about. And basically what this was designed to do was to give a level of oversight that we felt comfortable with, not to put you in the watchdog seat, <laughs> DC, but um, it also gave the community a chance to speak rather than feeling like things were happening to them, um, the dissolving um, the UVDC meant that that needed to go somewhere. And this seemed like a good avenue for there to be um, a little bit of enough of a pause in development um, that uh, a review was happening in a public space where people were able to comment and able to see and to be better understand. And what I found from my work on it was that we got a better result um, from really having that interaction with the community rather than kind of skipping that step and just having it be developer to city. Um, I was for it then, I'm for it now. Um, so uh, we saw we saw this as um, solving a few problems, actually. Um, and I remember speaking with Lucy about it as far as what does that then look like? And it was too early to be able to say whether DC got expanded um, and was larger because they needed to obviously absorb this workload. DC is already has a pretty full docket. Um, and so there was discussions with the city about how do we, how does this trickle down get affected? But um, we felt pretty firmly that this uh, solved several issues. I don't have a problem with it. I just wanted to know the specifics so that everybody was well aware of, of what was going on. Do I have any comments from the powers that be here? <laughs> I, I do have a question on your chart. Um, the, uh, on the revised table? Revised table. Oh, okay. Uh, just to, um, I'm not sure, I, I don't see level three on there. I wonder why it level three drops off. Yeah, I'm not Zero sure if that was a, um, error or not, you don't see the changes on there. So that table would have level three? You're right, yeah. It? Okay. Um, so level three, even on the handout, is not showing up. It's a gross, it's a gross um, three acres or more of, of gross floor area, and that would be combined 
any of the properties located on the blue corridors and anything greater than 45,000 square feet. And I, actually, I should apologize. The, the reason why you don't see it on this particular chart is because we, we, whoops, we took it off from the chart. The chart became too cumbersome to actually read because we've, we wanted to squeeze too much into those little boxes. So we decided instead of trying to squeeze in too much, we would just put it up above in text. So if you look in your packets, up above, you'll see how level three is actually described. You would still have the chart for levels zero and one? Correct, yes, yeah. Because it just became so cumbersome, we actually decided to, to type it out in a sentence and make it very clear. I guess my recommendation would be to have it in the table. I, I think for a lot of people, to, it's all clear in the table wherever if I'm a developer and I'm looking to figure out where I fit, right. I can see it in a table. I'm this big, this big, or this big. That's a great idea, and we could certainly there, go back so. and look at that. I know one of the comments that was made is that the city has a, a numerous, numerous footnotes, and that if we attempted to try to squeeze it into the table, it would just be a footnote to the table. So I'm willing to work with you guys however you think it would be best put in, but I'll, I'll, I'll definitely make that note in that comment. I think it would be best to say level, even if level two is blank, and then we skip to level three, have that notated. I'd rather have a note, um, say, I, a note saying. I'd rather have the cumbersome footnote than needing to rely on. Text above? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't mean the text above needs to go away. I just think that an addition to is, is preferred. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. I, I, since you're asking for questions, just a curiosity question. Did you do any assessment of kind of past development activity and match it up against the new thresholds to see what is the percentage of additional projects that would be in front of the development commission for just from a workload management standpoint? Not that, you know, we're feeling overworked. Not exactly that <laughs> analysis, but we did take a look at the parcels and noticed that it was, um, you know, over 100 parcels more would be added to the development commission's Potential. agenda potentially I mean we don't know when and, and if those will actually come to surface but there are very few parcels that don't meet any of the criteria um, and the one that we wouldn't really be able to pin down would be the the gross floor area of proposed development so and, and right now just um, what we have in the pipeline uh, as far as what's come in for like pre-apps or collaboration meetings there's really not a lot. So so if this code amendment goes through, it's not like, you know, a switch will turn and all of a sudden there's gonna be a ton of things on your, and we'll be asking you guys to meet every every two or three days. Um, that could happen though, Mike. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, if, if, if Central starts really taking off, you know, that could definitely happen and, and I think we could always adjust. Um, Joy had a suggestion earlier about, you know, we've talked about making subcommittees. There's things we can do if we get to that peak workload moment, but it's not on the horizon right now. I think you guys are gonna get maybe a high school and a middle school if the school district can buy land, but there's not a lot after that. You know, I would defer to my colleagues, uh, to Mike and, and Mel, who have been, are literally the senior members of the Development Commission in terms of, <laughs> I got more than you do. Uh, but it seems to me that I recall in the time that I've been on it that, that uh, 10 years ago, we were doing two applications a meeting and the meetings were every, you know, every other Wednesday. And then it's gone down. So as far as I'm concerned, there's, a, there's, a, there's some slack in there uh, in terms of what, what we were able to handle, I think, efficiently in terms of our, commit, our, our commitment individually to uh, Development Commission and where we've been in the last, I don't know, eight years or so. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not really, without understanding any more than I do now, and I'm not, certainly not speaking for my colleagues, but I, I remember when we had a lot more meetings with more applications per meeting than we've had in a long time. You're ready for more applications? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice well, to no, hear. I, I just, I think there's, I, I think there's, <laughs> there is a slack right. uh, between what we're, what we've been doing recently and what was the norm some time back. I think the city would appreciate more applications coming in for Central Issaquah. Well, and I, I guess my two cents would be that uh, the opportunity to be more, more transparent. You know, we see development happening often with nobody knowing for sure what, what's going on. So that, that opportunity for transparency is really high, uh, needs to be, and uh, it could really develop some good feelings towards the city to be able to have that open and, uh, and more opportunity for public input. Right, I, I, I agree. And the consistency with how the level three is uh, applied throughout the city is another bonus to this change. And just to throw, I'm totally green because I agree with Commissioner Lewis, the comment about, all of our comments about the openness and the ability for the public to have a chance to come in a common thing. Because I probably think at 150,000 square feet, at a thousand square foot a unit, somebody theoretically right now could have a 150 unit project come in, say on Gilman Boulevard, that would not go in front of a public hearing. And that would not seem appropriate in terms of the openness of that we've always had in Issaquah, so I'm totally for this amendment. I I think that was my concern with um, the presentation of, uh, uh, and I've just lost my train of thought. But um, if it was going to come back, if Gilman, if the uh, Gilman Boulevard. Uh, recommendations where it's not going to come back to PPC, then I would be very disappointed because I want that openness. I mean, that's the reason PPC is here, basically, is besides making comments, is to let everybody know what is going on in the community. So, um, so I, I, yes. And I uh, agree that there should be as much uh, on these. Uh, uh, this chart is possible, uh, not only for uh, people to understand, but I think it makes it would would make it easier for the development commission if it was specific, so that the uh, builders could come in and they could actually see on a chart. They didn't have to read something; they could see it on the chart and, and be clear before they even got to DC. Would the commission feel comfortable with staff going ahead and making that change, with the only change without coming back again? to another PPP, PPC meeting. Yeah. Is there anything else? No, I think um, piggybacking off Joy and everybody else, I think, like you said, more transparency is great. So um, we do need a, um, motion. a motion to accept. Um. Uh, the change and have it go on to city council. So would Excuse somebody me. like to make Excuse that Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So technically this is a public hearing. So we, I realize there's no one, I, I don't know if, but DC may want to get up and speak as residents here, but I think we need to open the public hearing and then close the public hearing before making a recommendation. So I can open the public meeting before we have a final vote on the motion. So I will open the public meeting Hearing. in regard to um, the development and design standards at 8.05. Would anybody like to come to the, the microphone and make any comments? Would anybody like to come to the microphone and make any comments? Hearing none, I will close the public meeting at 8.05 and a half. <laughs> and we will continue on with the motion. I'd like to make a motion for the city to take this to the city council with PBC's approval. I have a second. So I'll second the adoption of the finding of facts. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. You're welcome. <laughs> Great, thank you. Emily, do you have anything else to say? No, thank you for your time tonight. Okay. Would you and like... thank uh, the Development Commission for uh, their uh, great input on both of these issues. So thank you, and you're certainly welcome anytime you want to come. 
know, I don't, I, I don't think we do this more often. Uh, this, <laughs> this is, to me, this is a great improvement in the overall process for the PPC and the DC. For the, the PPC and the DC to meet and have the opportunity to actually discuss things and ask questions at, at this level. Uh, I just, I really, just, you know, it's not if it weren't mandatory, but if it continues to be, hey, you can come in and this is going to be the topic. Uh, I think it's very, especially on big things like this, yeah. I appreciate it. I agree. We really appreciate your collaboration. And as I talked to Mel earlier today, it goes both ways. So anytime that DC would like to invite us to come specifically <laughs> to join them, we are, we as a committee would be glad to uh, take part in any discussion. They're being sued right now. You want to be part of that? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I remember some uh, four and a half hour meetings that. Uh, Planning policy had last year over and over again, so uh, I think it's your turn. <laughs> so, uh, is there anything else for the good of the order? Joan, would you like to hear any updates on things that have gone to land and shore? Me? Would you all like to hear any updates on things that have gone to land and shore that you all recommended and where they might stand? I'm just thinking Old Town, land yes. and shore recommended approval with one change, so it goes to council on the 19th. Uh, the Partner to 43A, which you looked at tonight, permitted uses 43B, went back to land and shore, but is now being recommended for approval by them, and also goes on the 19th. And the last one uh, is with a caveat. With a, ca with a caveat, yes. So, um, so Council Member Hunt, um, you remember her? Um, she, <laughs> she, um, she was concerned about prohibiting duplex, triplex, and fourplexes in mixed use in the core. Her concern was about housing diversity. I think if you, uh, if you take out duplex, triplex, and fourplexes, then is the question that she raised is the only housing that you would get stacked flats. And I think if all we were getting were stacked flats um, and the core and mixed use is roughly 500 acres ish just under about um, so 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 we uh, we spooled up a conversation about uh, density and diversity so it's turned into density and diversity so so on one hand of the the spectrum is diversity and you know do we want our kind of core downtown part of the city all stacked flats um, but on the flip side, uh, and I think it's the reason why PPC uh, initially suggested removing duplex, triplex, fourplex from those zones, is uh, can we afford to develop, uh, redevelop part of our most dense part of central Issaquah in such a low density product type? And so, basically, uh, because it's, um, it's a complicated question, uh, and we had a month or less to actually start to uh, provide an analysis. We, we kicked the can. Um, so what is going back to council on the 19th on table 43B is to adopt the edits that came through PPC except for reserving the removal of duplex, triplex, fourplex until a bigger con a bigger analysis of density and diversity of housing can be done by the administration in 2019. So they basically pulled that one piece out and didn't say we don't support it, said we need more information. We want to go ahead and get the rest of 43B adopted, but this one element needs to have a bigger conversation and so that will likely be something that the administration starts with brings back to PPC and then back to council to resolve it next year so sorry for that it was that's a little okay more no that was good to include and then the, the last one is the zoning of the intensive commercial and what was destination retail they were pulled out of central Issaquah and they are being recommended for approval, but the destination retail area, and I, I believe the development standards that you all discussed with the property owners are remaining essentially the same, 
what's changing is the name. It's not going to be destination retail, it will be mixed use. So the area is south of I-90. So that has also been recommended for approval. And once that happens, the boundaries, the new Central Issaquah neighborhoods and the boundaries will become effective. The visions are already in place, but everything else will become effective. When is that happening? It, that also goes on the 19th, and the, everything should become effective by around the end of November, November 30th. I like hearing the, the feedback. That's really nice. You're welcome. We like knowing that the council agrees with what we came up with. That's even better. So, um, hearing no other comments, concerns, I'm going to close the meeting at 8. 12 and remind everybody that there was a meeting on the 15th. Pickering Hopefully, room. Hopefully um, you'll all be here. Pickering. Pickering room. So thank you. Mm -hmm.